Um, so my name is Flora Barisha, and thanks for introduction, and thanks, Tom, for inviting me today. Um, so I'm a director of companion diagnostics at Daiichi Senko, so I lead several projects there. And uh, today, um, what I will talk, which is going to be a nice follow-up of Kim's presentation on challenges in developing companion diagnostics and uh, alignment with stakeholders at Daiichi. So why this piece is, in, is important, uh, she uh, shared uh, quite um, uh, value information around the partners and how we um, deal with the relationship with the partners, but it's always very important to think from um, company, pharma perspective, what do we do to make sure that this is a success? And what I will share today is the story at Daiichi. And as many of you farmers being present here may find those informations relevant and um, you know important for discussion today. Um, if I recall it early on, uh, 10 years before getting to this field, um, one of my colleagues well known in, in space uh, mentioned that partnership is like marriage not always works, but you have to make it work. It's a long relationship and you need to be there and help the partners to succeed. So how do you do that? And you cannot do that alone. So it's very important to engage internal pharma, understanding the needs and understanding uh, the challenges around the space and how quick it's evolving. To Kim's point, you, you go really fast and then go back and you start again from the same point. So those challenges uh, I would like to discuss today. Okay, so this is an um, agenda I'm covering. So um, I will um, give an overview of challenges around biomarker selection, and then um, I will go over uh, where we are today and some um, discuss the pathways at Daiichi and uh, summarize in the end. Uh, hopefully I can open for question and discussions. So um, I will start with this statement, a bad test is every bit as bad as a bad drug. So the test is quite important and uh, having the wrong biomarker is wasted of drug development efforts and loss of treatment opportunity. And poor analytical performance is obscures drugs effect and wrong patient treatment. So uh, from yesterday talk, um, Nick shared some numbers, 80,000 biomarkers as of right now, and expected to be four biomarker per gene. And very recent look into molecular uh, biology book, we have about 100,000, so that's a lot of biomarkers. So classifying them and understanding them and how we make them valuable to our programs, they are seen in this three bucket as prognostic, predictive, and selective. And this bar share um, progression or uh, the necessary or likelihood of being a CDX going from a prognostic, providing uh, about risk, information about the risk of disease, and then predictive, the benefit, uh, identify patients most likely to benefit from the treatment, and then moving to selection where patient population eligible for specific therapy where companion diagnostic is a must. So um, in, in general, uh, this selection is done based on the uh, driven by science and from the clinical team. And the agency does not have a pre-specified level of evidence or how to separate those in groups. So that's why early on interaction with regulatory is important to understand what this biomarker mean, even though it's too soon, phase one or phase two, and how do we handle the development uh, with that particular biomarker. So uh, this slide is what we common use at Daiichi um, because it's, it's uh, the concept around uh, a test. It's, it's, it's um, difficult to share with uh, stakeholders and internally uh, that it's more than just a test. It's a very complex system starting from reagents and going all the way to the physician interpretation. So all this, including the software, algorithms, all of this which comprises the final regulated product. 
So it is very important to, uh, to remind internally that it's a lot of work being done um, from our partners. So who do we engage from drug development team? Business development, which is the key. Uh, once that agreement is in place, you are committed to that and you are there to implement. Um, requires specific and unique skills. At this time, uh, you know, uh, we are new into oncology space and there we need to understand as this field is evolving that sometimes, to Kim's point, we have to be creative and to find what best model fit for our, um, for our um, program. And uh, multiple partners are a frequent possibility, which hopefully we'll see this more and more when we have a, you know, a, a fair, um, a test and a generic test and then we allow you know patients to have access to this test and go from there with a the drug instead of having multiple tests for multiple biomarkers. A clinical team at times they're very busy and sometimes it's a disconnection but they are a key to support the validation of the DX to accommodate the needs going from you know type of um, samples being collected, the, the value of the biomarker, the cutoff, which is a very important piece. Uh, translational, provide technical input. Uh, it's always important. We depend on our partners. We trust them, but at the same time, the inside or preclinical data that we have sometimes is very important in that early development of the assay. Medical, input on design goals and assess the product design. Uh, regulatory, it's always um, important. Those timelines from the partner need to align um, with the uh, NDA uh, uh, filing. So it is very critical at times we do not, we start very late the process. So, but the expectations are for us to deliver the uh, the, the uh, test in the same time, to file at the same time. So it takes a lot of discussion to make sure that, um, uh, you know, the partner understands uh, our timelines, but at the same time, internally, the clinical team and the rest other functionals understand the changes that may occur. So it comes down all to risk assessment, okay? is no such perfect test. That's what the common language we use internally. but. As long as you uh, recognize those risks and you have a mitigation plan, then uh, you are in good place and you have the internal support that you need. It's not just those high amount of dollars putting towards and it's not just agreement, but that support will be all the way in the end. Commercial, input and design goals and launch planning. This is uh, where I would um, extend a little bit comments where I feel it's more um, my concern, my personal concern. Uh, we have seen through the years a lot of involvement going from development. We had no idea with the bridging studies. We had situations that were very challenged, so we overcome that. And we very well understand in order to um, have a successful test, if you're not starting phase three with that, bridging is important. And then regulatory space. Yesterday was a great day sharing even more evolving around the regulatory, but um, a lot of improvement we see not only from FDA, but uh, global with other regions, Japan, EU, and other regions as well. So, but the only piece that I, I do, uh, we struggle at Daiichi is the commercial. So the moment you put this test out there, um, then um, you're dealing with a lot of many other tests in, in, in the space. And then uh, the value of your test, which is validated best on your clinical trial, it's not there. So where do we put the efforts? How do you go by? Do you commercialize fully and invest to fully commercialization? Which I will talk a little bit later what those steps are. Or do you uh, invest in addition how to harmonize the existing test? Because a lot of those decisions from doctors will be made from this homebrew assays. So I think uh, it's a disconnection between regulatory and reimbursement. And we saw some improvement from CMS having parallel review and giving advantage to this new multiplexing. But I think there we still need to do a lot of work and to, to raise um, the awareness how to improve that part. 
Uh, and then reimbursement and market access is, is very important. Medical affair, commercial, and reimbursement group talk together before launching, know what are their goals are, the message that they're going to take to every doctor, and then they need really to align well those with the uh, payers as well. So uh, how do we manage team expectation? So design the CDX strategy based on the clinical need, share risk assessment mitigation plan, and help the clinical team to understand the challenges and those changes that occur daily in our field. Engage them in developing process so they understand the schedules, risks around it, communicate status widely and frequently. Um, they're not, it's not their objectives, they're there to support you. So at times they forget what are the complications around it. So tailor the message to the audience. Um, we make sure that we all the time will go to, you know, um, um, our um, teams and to share uh, the updates around the development, but in the same time, you don't want to give them lots of details, but the messages around what are those risks and how we're progressing towards that. And which is the most important one, prepare the team for changes. Partner strategy, development program, uh, regulatory strategy, and uh, as, as, as again from the previous talk, this, this area is evolving. So those changes are present. And sometimes it's very hard from internally to understand that and to, so you really need to keep that and inform the teams at all time. Um, developing a regulatory strategy. Um, global strategy, other regions, DX requirement are involving and may require additional development work. So for us, we are a Japanese company. And um, so it's always our goal as to launch here in the US. We simultaneously always launch in, in Japan as well. So then it's very important, even though PMDA have done some improvement and changes currently, However, they do stick by what they call more uh, focusing in analytical piece, such as stability or other pieces uh, with analytical, and not as much as FDA will focus in manufacturing. So when you prepare those documentation or develop that particular program or test, you have to keep those in mind that the requires are slightly different. Um, and the intended use drives the strategy. Um, so clinical strategy is linked to the regulatory plan. So we have to make sure patient cohort selection, it's based on this biomarkers, alignment with drug, drug trial, and consider the requirement for IDE. Um, if patient selection will occur during the clinical trial. Even when you feel like you don't need an ID, I think it's, it's best. FDA have been great and open to those discussions, which wasn't <laughs> occurring um, five years ago. So now you reach out to them and, of course, uh, coordinate with them uh, CDER and CDRH. So launch here, again, I, I spoke about this because I see I have uh, five minutes and I'm running out of time, but there are a lot to do in commercial and uh, they should not be last, right? So they should be in the team. We have structure in place where commercial is present, regulatory is present, uh, medical affair, and then we discuss along through two years of development to what's coming and how we want to improve um, before we go to, uh, to launch. And so, um, where are we today? Pharma fully understands the requirements of CDX development. Uh, it seems we are in much better place in that aspect. Um, unmet medical need and highly competitive space in oncology uh, is challenged by the same biomarker multiple drugs, evaluating the risk of existing tests. And, and I, I just put a question there, can pharma work together to, to Brian's question and, uh, you know, how we can leverage that and just create a fair field for big farmers and small farmers <laughs> working together when they have a common biomarkers. Um, so the outcome of the phase one to trial in relation biomarkers is no, not well understood, so it's a quite investment up front, things changing, right? So we want to go really quick, we do not go to phase three and then have proof of concept. So things are, you know, wrapping up pretty quick, so it's very important to uh, do some investment, prepare for it, um, and then if it's become a companion diagnostic, then, then you go full speed. And of course, early communication with um, health authorities is uh, key. 
Um, so with technology evolving, will NGS be the future? How we become part of this process early on? So that's we get a lot of question internal and you all may feel related to it. And again, to the first point that I had, can we work together? Uh, I think uh, I, Russ here, my boss, and uh, Daichi overall, we are in the concept of having, um, uh, you know, a multiple, you know, uh, collaboration with other pharmas and share this, you know, and share this opportunity to share the biomarkers. It's a, a, a tricky model, but I think can be done if we have a good uh, efforts that in the end this was going to serve to patients. Um, so, uh, and a gap between the regulatory and reimbursement process, and I will not uh, spend more time to that, but it's still a lot of investment need to be done. So if I'm investing to the partner, then I have to do and select a third party to harmonize the small local labs and make sure they're aligned with my test, right? So it's an it's a addition uh, investment into that because you can't avoid. Or you're going to let those assays fly and make the doctors make decision whatever the assay they create in-house. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to go quick through this uh, three scenarios. Um, so this is a typical, um, you know, when you have time to do it in the right way, this is never a reality. However, what we are, the concept is, can we start a little bit early that we can um, implement during the clinical trial, and then we can transition quick to the full CDX, some such hybrid assays that are created by, um, by uh, diagnostics, and then we can implement them during the trial, and then uh, if that is a potential companion diagnostics required, and then you can transition to full companion diagnostics, where the whole analytical part is done by that time. So um, this will be higher price than clinical trial assay, but a lot less the final commercial assay, but faster transition. Because sometimes when you do that quick transition, it, it, it can cause a lot of um, problems if the biomarker is necessary. And then, you know, if you get the post-commitment, it's great. But if you don't, then what do you do? Um, and then this is the higher risk one when you don't do anything. I have to explain all of this internally so then the clinical team know how to make a decision. You don't do anything and then you're going to run in the bridging and then may delay the filing. So, um, and I put an example here, septin herbitox as, as um, cases of this situation. So, and there are risks associated with uh, pathway three and bridging is one of them. Um, and so here we go, I listed a lot of uh, risks around uh, bridging and sticking with, you know, uh, not doing anything, using clinical trial and then uh, struggling to um, align with the clinical trial assay, which it gets more difficult. Um, so some of the things that we consider is, do we have the freedom to use archived samples? So we have to include that in protocol. Do we know sample stability? That's become key after five years. What do you do with those samples? And have the clinical team standardize the protocol for sample tissue collection? Um, this is very important. Every region is different. So you have to really uh, structure them well, the consent forms, to make sure you have those additional uh, material to do that, if you go that. And uh, how do we medicate? the risk for not having samples for all testing, right? So you have 70% of samples. What type of analysis you do and how you mitigate with FDA, is that amount of samples sufficient? Um, so here an example of Xalcori, which is, um, you know, uh, you already are aware of, and this is following the pathway one when you have and build and run the phase three using the study. And then you have uh, the, the extended approval for ROS1 uh, when you had a breakthrough approval with post-marketing. That was great. Um, however, is it the same situation for other regions, right? So this is a challenging that regulatory, and I always challenge them as much as I can when I meet them, that how the harmonization across global is going, because it's slightly different. And take home message, um, every CDX development situation is unique. Follow science and be creative. Clarify the biomarker intended use. Select the right pathway that fits your clinical strategy the best. Evaluate the select uh, the right partner capable to develop, file, and most important, commercialize uh, a successful test. 
and of course early discussion with regulatory and I believe um, and I don't know if anyone feel connected to it and we can extend during the panel that sometimes that alignment with stakeholders to, to, to be there with you in every decision you make it's very key and how you do that how you find the internal uh, internal resources to support partners okay so it's a, it's fair to to have both sides to work hard to deliver that they, they they stand there for the test we stand for the drug and we both need each other so with that thank you very much and um, we'll we'll meet the panel if there's any question thank you